talk a little bit about the theater organ here at Clemens Center. Uh, it's a very long story. Maybe two hours wouldn't be enough, but I'll try to give you a little overview of the instrument from the beginning of its time here and about up to where we are now. Uh, the instrument started out in 1925, built for Keeney's Theater here in Elmira, New York, and was built by the Marn Colton Company of Warsaw, New York. Now it's a very interesting story and the details are lost to history as to how this instrument started out here. But here's some background information. Um, the Marr and Colton Company was formed in 1915 by David Marr and John Colton, who up until that point were employees of the Wurlitzer Company in North Tonawanda. Prior to that, they were both employees of the Hope Jones Organ Company here in Elmira. David Marr being uh, an immigrant from England who had known Robert Hope Jones for some time and came with him to this country. And then uh, it, it would appear uh, that John Colton was an Elmira resident who began working in the factory. And apparently uh, a close friendship developed and uh, they set off on their own company in 1915. The instrument as it was built here uh, opening in December of 1925, had three keyboards, three manuals, of course the pedal board, and the pipes were arranged in three chambers, either side of the proscenium and one up in the dome called the echo organ. It was actually a fairly large instrument for a theater of this size at that point, comprising of 20 ranks, 20 different voices, and a variety of percussion voices and sound effects, all intended to accompany silent films or any stage acts that might have required some additional music, um, probably augmenting the small theater orchestra that was here at the time. The instrument you know, performed its role admirably uh, in those days. Uh, it was the largest instrument in town uh, for a a theater organ. There were four or five other theaters that also had theater pipe organs at the same time. Everybody went to the movies in the 1920s. Pre-television, what else was there to do on a weekend? So uh, it was a very enthusiastic time uh, until that thing called the jazz singer uh, sounded the doom for live music really in theaters uh, with sound on film and uh, it just caused all these instruments to fade away and become dormant for a great period of time. We know it was played in the 30s on occasions and uh, was played in the early 1940s, um, but then in 1946, the Shemung River overflowed its banks, a few feet of water on stage, the console floated, the blower downstairs was inundated, and the organ was silenced at that point. Um, in the 1950s, the building was renovated and modernized, uh, which kind of meant trying to erase any uh, of the grandeur of the 1920s. Uh, everything was draped or painted or padded, and nobody cared about the organ because it didn't play. It was lying in a heap uh, in one corner of the pit. Um, and in the course of time, uh, there was vandalism and damage that happened in the various organ chambers. Uh, a large percentage of the pipework uh, disappeared or was damaged beyond repair. And so it sat for many, many years uh, until uh, around 1960, late 1960, I believe, uh, a group of um, enthusiastic friends uh, who were members of the American Theater Organist Enthusiast uh, we're going to concerts around New York State and well connected with the scene, uh, the scene as it was in Buffalo, Rochester, Syracuse, and, and farther afield, and uh, began exploring and uh, looking for awareness of other instruments. And those three people were my father, Lauren Peckham, Dave Teeter, and Bob Oppenheim. And uh, Dave Teeter had actually played this instrument when he was in grammar school, so he remembered it. And after months of negotiations with theater management, uh, who was not too keen on somebody prowling about the building, it was a working theater after all, showing many films per day. Uh, and Dave Teeter was an attorney, so he was well connected in the community and could use the persuasive powers of law and connections uh, to finally gain admittance um, so they could look over the instrument, find out what shape it was in. And what a sorry sight must have greeted their eyes because uh, uh, problems in every organ chamber, the console caked in mud lying in its back in the pit, uh, but they saw potential 
Somehow they thought this was a great idea. I think if I had seen it at the time, I would have just turned around and headed to the local tavern. But the, they decided it would be a project because they knew of other people restoring theater organs in other cities in the state and the country and worked out an agreement um, to have access. And the theater management said, well, okay, but we're not putting any money into this. It has to be your own funding and your own time. And so it went. For the next several years, uh, those three people, um, along with a few other volunteers, pitched in. Uh, Dave Teeter provided a great deal of uh, capital uh, to purchase supplies. I actually purchased another Marin Colton theater organ from the uh, Palace Theater in Jamestown, New York, which provided a lot of parts that they absolutely needed at that time. Um, they slaved away for years and uh, had it playing, I believe, by early 1963. So a few years went by. Uh, there was a feature article in the American Theater Organ Enthusiast Journal in March of 1963 featuring this instrument and talking about how it was coming along and there would be a concert soon. And that concert happened in 1964 with Dean Robinson, who uh, played a, a lot in this area, primarily uh, as a restaurant organist playing the Hammond organ. But he started out on one of these instruments as a, a teenager. And so it went. They had done all this work. They put it together. But that was still with a room that was uh, uh, under the spell of the 1952 renovation with lots of draping and padding. The instrument was quite underwhelming. Uh, it was so muffled by all the drapes in front of the gold grills that it, it was a pretty sound. It was very polite, but it really didn't jump out and grab you the way most people expect a theater organ to, uh, to accomplish that goal. So uh, there it was, the 1960s, and occasionally people would stop by, other theater organists or people interested, and would come in, you know, when the theater wasn't running as a movie house, play it for a little bit, and I grew up hearing about this and seeing the instrument on occasion, and I did manage to play it in early of 1972. Well, for locals around here, 1972 is a really important year in a bad way. Uh, it's when the remains of Hurricane Agnes uh, kind of wallowed over this region for a few days, dropping a lot of rain, and the Shemung River again overflowed its banks. Water came all through Elmira and the south side, and it was a, really a calamity for the entire region. Uh, for this building in particular, uh, this being the most severe flood in anybody's recorded history, uh, with the stage actually below street level. It was eight feet of water on the stage. The console floated again until it could all be pumped out, and uh, things looked pretty bleak at that point. I remember seeing it after that. The console completely dissolved. Every glue joint uh, that had any strength at all from the previous flood gave up, and it was just a pile of just ivories and some plastic stop keys and uh, the cabinet caked in mud but just collapsed into a, a pancake basically and so it looked bleak uh, I remember the uh, the fire company coming in with uh, high pressure hoses washing mud down the aisles and off the seats to attempt to clean up this place and it did reopen uh, as the Elmira theater which it had been since 1952 uh, but it looked pretty sad for the organ. Who had the interest uh, of those three people that had worked in the 60s? Uh, they all had families. They all had careers they were busy taking care of. And not a whole lot of inclination to do it all over again. So a um, period of time went by, and there was the uh, imminent demise of this building with the expansion of the road uh, out to my left. And fortunately, community leaders got together and said, we need to save this building. And with their vision, they created the Clemens Performing Arts Center and got in touch with those three amigos from the beginning, my father, Dave Teeter, and Bob Oppenheim, um, asking if they were interested in doing this again with some light funding. And two of the three did agree to this, and we plunged in. Uh, this is 1977. The wheels were beginning to turn on this in 1976, but it really wasn't until the spring of 1977 that the work began in earnest, both with this building, which was undergoing a new transformation with uh, pulling down the draping and the padding, uh, repainting what was in here, uh, some basic stage work, uh, reducing the seating area in the balcony, and adding on a new lobby because the road did have to be widened out to my left. 
and we jumped into work on the organ. Now, I was um, youngish then, let's call it high school, and uh, we didn't have a console and didn't really know how this was going to pan out, uh, but luckily uh, we heard of a Wurlitzer console that was unneeded in Buffalo uh, at the Basilica of Our Lady of Victory in Lackawanna. And while not built to be a theater organ, it essentially was a theater organ installed in this magnificent basilica. Uh, the pipework had been sold off for other purposes, and the console was an orphan. And we, uh, we, <laughs> I wasn't really a part of this, but I was helping. Uh, arrangements were made, and Clemens Center had funding to obtain the console, which was basically a cabinet at that point, and brought it in and went through all the wiring uh, to get it connected to the instrument. Uh, a new blower was fabricated in the basement, and we had it playing for the Clemens Center opening in October of 1977. And uh, I was on the bench for that evening. It was a grand affair. And at that point, the organ was playing basically as it had been in 1925. Uh, the 1960s renovation had changed a few things, but it was essentially an instrument of now four manuals, four keyboards, and 20 voices in all the percussion. Well, uh, one thing about uh, a theater organ is they are hardly ever left untouched, um, whether by the ravages of, the of time or well-intentioned efforts to improve them. In this case, um, efforts to improve were well warranted. The Marr and Colton Company, the original builders, um, while being, I believe, the fifth largest manufacturer in terms of instruments produced. It was actually a very low quality company. Uh, they cut corners on a lot of things, didn't worry about certain details, and it's, it's, it basically involves everything that happens in the chambers and uh, nowhere near the quality of what the Wurlitzer Company was doing or Robert Morton or Kimball or several others. So there was room for improvement and that began right off the bat uh, by 1978 Dave Teeter had uh, d donated the funding for a new rank called an English post horn, which is a very brassy, fiery sound that is found in most large theater organs. And it sounds like this. So that's used for bright accents and sort of the crowning voice with full organ. Um, other changes were coming along at that point and starting to um, exchanged some pipe work, relocated in the chambers, and we had a concert series running for some time until uh, a major roof leak that happened in the chamber up on this side in fall of 1982. So barely five years the instrument was up and running when it was absolutely silenced by what happened at that point. So going through the, uh, the hassles of insurance and uh, coming up with a plan, um, we plunged into the work again. But this time it was really a recasting of everything in that department as well as renovating the console and bringing it a lot closer to what was to be expected in an instrument of this size. And a few different sets of pipes were added. More things were exchanged from one side to the other, trying to drag it a little bit closer to the norm, um, the accepted norm of what the World Star Company would build. And so it went. That went on for three years, and I think our reopening was 1985, again in the fall of 1985. But I couldn't leave well enough alone. By then I was out of college and um, beginning to play concerts and travel a little bit and experiencing what other instruments could do in a positive and a negative way. And being a student of the instrument, um, listening to lots of recordings, talking to other organists, organ builders who very freely shared what they knew and what they thought might be possible here. And I, I kept synthesizing all these ideas, continually making changes over kind of the next 15 years or so and um, getting it better, better, nudging along. And then we came to the phase two renovation of Clemens Center, uh, which is what, 10 or 11 years ago, I think now, uh, where the entire building was going to have a, a complete a top to bottom renovation, essentially. Uh, the stage house to be expanded, um, this beautiful hall to be brought very close to its 1925 appearance. And here was an opportunity to work with the instrument uh, one more time. Uh, 
even though the word restoration had been applied much too freely over the years, it never really had a restoration. It had renovation and upgrades, changes, but, but not a restoration. And I still wouldn't say it's ever had a restoration because, goodness, I would not want to return it to how it would have sounded in 1925. It would have been a pretty feeble excuse for a theater organ. It would have been grand for the day, but not what we expect now. So. Here we are coming up to about 10 years ago and the opportunity to really go at it and um, kind of a bare bones budget uh, was procured, uh, but we stuck to that and most of the instrument was removed from the chambers when all the heavy lifting was going on in here. It was an astonishing time when we had access to see how they were pulling off the old paint and trying to get to the original colors, scaffolding all over. Most of the concrete in this area was knocked out. A, a new pit area was created, so this is all new. And at the same time, the instrument was in my shop. Um, working slowly at restoring the different components. There, I'll use that word, restoring, uh, like dismantling down to their molecules, refinishing, all new gaskets, anything that could be replaced to be remanufactured was done, along with acquiring a lot of other vintage material of um, better quality. Uh, a lot of things from the World Sir Company have made their way into this instrument. Uh, a lot of great supporters um, added their uh, some time for volunteering, um, financial assistance, which was very important, uh, as some donations of equipment as well. And while it ran on longer than anybody would have liked, uh, it was in the fall of 2014 when the organ returned to be presented to the public for the first time. And the work is never done. It's still going on with refining things and listening, making changes, and as recently as a month ago, I'm speaking to you now in 2020. Uh, we made it another change in exchanging out one set of pipes, adjusting the dynamics and the relationships of another set as well. And, and so it goes. Uh, we have plans for another exchange coming up, hopefully in the coming weeks. Um, Bernita Oppenheim, the, uh, the dear widow of Bob Oppenheim, who passed away just a few months ago, um, has agreed to contribute things from her home instrument uh, that Bob had installed many years ago. And there's a, a lovely set of pipes there that uh, will certainly be an upgrade to what we have in the instrument right now. So it's ongoing. It will never be finished, I suppose. Uh, it currently incorporates some things that are really unusual for a theater organ. But at 31 sets of pipes, it is one of the largest instruments in the eastern part of the United States. And uh, I'm delighted with how it has turned out over this time. It's beyond my wildest fantasy uh, for a musical breathing instrument uh, that can certainly stand up for a solo concert, um, integrates well with our symphony orchestra and other small groups. Uh, some of the unusual things we have here uh, would be a vibraphone stop that was um, acquired from a studio instrument in the Detroit area. I think the world would be a happier place if it heard sounds like that more often. And uh, we, we have a, a harmonic flute um, that was originally in a municipal organ in Scranton, Pennsylvania, built by the Kimball Company. Uh, a lovely solo voice on the quiet side. It's not supposed to dominate the ensemble. And other things we have added, um, not necessarily added, expanded. I, early I mentioned the echo chamber up in the dome. Um, when the organ was built, it had three sets of pipes up there, a very quiet flute, a very quiet violin, and a voice called a vox humana, which is supposed to be a mild imitation of the human voice, and the Latin vox humana, um, but it's kind of a plaintive, quiet sound. And that chamber had been completely destroyed during the 1950s, and I had put some things up there in the 70s, but it never really got any place and never had any finishing. Well, now it's been expanded up to five sets of pipes and the very quietest one starts off sounding like this. Now I close it down and it disappears. There is a matching set of pipes 
you will hear this that is tuned slightly sharp. Just a slight undulation and a waver to it. Another set of pipes that are a little bit louder than that. Again, two pairs tuned in undulation. And this Vakshimana stop that I mentioned. Which isn't very interesting that way, but it's meant to be with vibrato. And if we add all of them together and give it a little bit more swirl, we get this effect. While echo organs were not really unusual in the 1920s, they tended to happen in the early 20s and fell out of fashion. We believe this is the only functioning echo organ in a theater organ in its original home uh, left in the country and possibly the world. So it's, uh, it, it's kind of neat to have that effect that way. Uh, we also added another set of uh, very low pitched string voices. Originally, it had uh, this gamba I acquired another set uh, that originally was installed in the theater in, in Auburn New York and then it spent about 50 years at St. Patrick's Church in Corning where it had to be very polite you know playing a mass and so these are tuned again in the undulation And they are Mar and Colton pipes, so uh, they, they get along very well together. Um, we acquired a, a set of big husky bassoon sounds uh, from the Garden State chapter of the American Theater Organ Society. These were built by the Robert Morton Company. Which is sort of a mezzo voice, gives a little bit more definition to the pedal line. Uh, we also added a 12 notes uh, of what's called a metal diaphone built by the Wurlitzer Company. These showed up on basically every organ that the Wurlitzer Company built from six voices on up. And it's a really important sound for um, giving an underpinning in a very clear, precise way. Now, by itself, and however you're listening to this, that's probably not very interesting. But for a theater organist, uh, these low pitches are really important for pulling the texture together and supporting it, and really in a very orchestral way. Um, it's not supposed to be an organ. It's supposed to be an orchestra that happens to be powered by wind. And we also um, expanded and modified an existing set of pipes to be very low pitched, which probably doesn't come across on your audio at all, but those are some floor rumblers and uh, some other floor rumblers that are uh, will take too long to explain because it's my own experiment, but it works and it's the only one in the theater organ that I know of. And we have the other usual complement of goodies here. Uh, there's uh, one standard flute. And then another flute uh, that was actually built by a local organ company in the 1890s. Uh, it was built for the First Baptist Church, just about a block and a half away from here. And this doesn't really get used with theater organ playing, but it's perfect for working with the orchestra sometimes or accompanying a solo singer, say if we were doing a production of Messiah or something like that. Um, We have two voices of diapason sounds that are pretty typical. And then the big one on the other side. In other orchestral voices, a clarinet.
a small covered oboe sound. And some more colorful sounds that are also reeds. They have a, a small brass or phosphor bronze reed vibrating inside. There's the oboe, a canura, which is a little buzzy thing. Um, our saxophone, uh, which is a new built copy of a voice that the Wurlitzer Company made which may not sound like a saxophone to you, um, but in the right circumstances, it is an indispensable voice uh, for the theater pipe organ. Um, on the bigger side, we have a tuba voice over here, which runs down to the big guy. Its counterpart on the other side So it's kind of like stereo from one side to the other. A brighter trumpet sound. But we can put all three of those together, plus uh, the English post horn that I mentioned earlier. And it's something quite fiery for fanfares. And it, it might sound like this. Um. variety of string tone in the organ, two quiet pairs that live in the chamber on this side. And then a slightly buzzier pair in that side. Another pair slightly bigger on the other side. So if we put all of them together, it's a quite a swirly effect. And then the soul of the theater pipe organ is a set of pipes called the tibia clausa. We have two of them here, one in each side. There's the small one. Uh, it, these are generally never meant to be played without vibrato. If you play without vibrato, you get a sound kind of like a, a calliope. Which is okay, but that's not what we're here for. We're here for something that's supposed to sound like a really passionate singer, so we add vibrato to that. That's the small one, and then on the other side, it's a bigger sibling. We mix the two of them, and we can draw these at many different pitches. We also have a variety of sound effects, which are basically from, from the days of accompanying silent film. So, snare drum, tambourine, woodblock number one, number two, one cymbal here, choke cymbal, another cymbal, triangle, kettle drum, bass drum, uh, another bird effect, a buzzer, for uh, office scenes in silent films. The telephone, and uh, possibly my favorite, the horn department. So uh, if you have a traffic jam in 1927, we're ready for it. And there's a few other things down here. What do we have? Uh, siren. Um, a tom-tom. Sleigh bells, a uh, little acme siren, which is always good. Um, let's see, the surf effect. And 
and up in the dome, a Chinese gong. And two other cymbals. And crash. So you put all that together and stir it around, give it a good shake, and you've got a theater organ in a beautiful room, and we're so lucky to have it here at Clement Center.